All right. So uh, my my uh, talk or my presentation basically will just center around more of a lessons learned uh, in terms of looking at China's uh, rise because we've heard so much from within, but how is it perceived from from outside, particularly for us here in Africa who have been struggling with the question of development and poverty alleviation for decades. So uh, looking at it from outside as an, as an African or as a Nigerian and African looking at China, there are, there are very clear lessons you know, that we can learn. One of them is the importance of political institutions. And when it, co when it comes to development, that, that it cannot be emphasized enough that if you, if you lack you know, a state and state with, with strong and accountable political institutions, you would not be able to achieve the kind of success or even come close to what, uh, what, what China has been able to achieve over the, you know, the last you know, uh, 100 years or since 1949, to be more precise. Now, uh, with the, the Chinese party state is a product of a people's re revolution. And that not, not only gives it legitimacy to govern you know, uh, the People's Republic of China, but also comes to an enormous responsibility to be accountable uh, to, to the people. So it is not, surpri it's not surprising that it is centenary of, this, of the Chinese, uh, uh, the Communist Party of China, that they have chosen, you know, the, uh, poverty alleviation as the, the, uh, the achievement that they are most proud of. It, that it is only it's only a socialist or a Marxist country, you know, that will do that because there are so many other achievements that they can, they can actually use as the one, you know, one that they are most proud of. And then secondly, uh, the, the role of the state is something that is also very, very instructive because you would see with, with the Chinese model, the state is not a spectator or I say laser first state you know, that we here in Africa have been, we've been beating down our necks or our heads rather with all of these uh, you know, uh, Western institutions, the IMF, World Bank, always uh, asking for a small state, a small state and opening up the, the economy that would definitely lead to prosperity. It hasn't worked and it's not it's currently you know, not working. And further down this talk, I'm going to, to touch on that a little bit more. So that's you know, that system where you have a, a state leading, not, not uh, leading the the, the, the it's very, very important. And then for, for, for very specific reason, you would find with China that the, there's more emphasis on account on a substan substantial accountability as opposed to procedural accountability. What I mean by that is when a state is judged or the, what the, 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 the importance of the state, or sorry, the, the, the citizenry looks at the state, or the, sorry, the, the state looks at its functionality or its ability to provide basic needs you know, and prosperity to the people as more important than, you know, uh, merely holding, you know, elections. This, 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 this seems like, you know, an ideological standpoint, but it comes with very practical and very pragmatic uh, benefits when the political institutions prioritize, you know, substance over, over, over procedures. And also, you also find that with the, with the, with the importance of rule of law, and also the independence of the states to be, to be able to govern their affairs and direct how development is, is going you know, to go. One, one very short example would be many of the, during the course of China's development, you'll find that they've a lot of experimentation. I can almost guarantee that China would not have been able to put out, you know, experiment and try some of those, uh, those uh, uh, po uh, policies, for instance, this you know, real relocation of people, if it's, if it's a development part is being charted by the World Bank, because we hear things like, you know, what about people's rights to their land and things like that. But for us in Africa, we always ask the question, what, what about people's right to eat, you know, to live in a decent home and, and a, 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 a decent environment with clean water, you know, food and all of that. that, that that's also very important. But like, like I said, all of those, those processes that we've seen China, some of the process rather that we've seen China enact or policies rather, would not have been possible, you know, if they, there was no political institutions were not independent of foreign, you know, uh, influence over the course of the last uh, forty years or even going back hundred years. Now, another uh, another aspect of this look of uh, looking at China would be the importance of soft and hard infrastructure. 
you know, earlier on, earlier on uh, in this talk, we had very important, you know, statistics comparing what was achieved, what was, for instance, uh, in 1949, when Mao took over, or have life expectancy was about, you know, 35, 35 years. You know, literacy rate was 15%. Immunization rate was actually zero. This I actually found when I was preparing for this. And then by 76, when when Mao, when Mao died, you know, average life expectancy was was you know was near, was about an immunization rate was 100. percent You know, oftentimes you always hear uh, the talk that it was under Deng that you know China was able, able to develop like as if nothing what didn't happen or all that happened before Deng Xiaoping was disaster or leftist one left fail leftist policy you know over another. But the way I always like to you know, think of it is. China crawled under under Mao so it could run under Deng and fly, you know, under uh, uh, President Xi. And really, literally, China is flying today. It's it's, uh, it's, it's even in uh, as a fluent of this world, given the you know, Chinese space station. But more, more seriously, when I what I mean by flying here, I'm talking about trans transferring growth or transforming growth into real development. And not just GDP growth, but actual you know, life chances and, co and quality of life. And it is something that is missing from the policy discourse, you know, even here in Nigeria. Let me give an example. Nigeria, Nigeria is, you know, it's ranked 27th in the world in terms of GD GDP, with uh, or GDP of 448 billion. Meanwhile, Denmark, for instance, you know, comes in at uh, 48, you know, with a GDP around 300 and, uh, 350 billion. But I can. You don't need to look at any other inf information to know that. We, uh, so you don't. You need, to, you need to look at the other statistics in the country, like Human Development Index, you know, mortality, rate, infant morbidity, you know, uh, enrollment rates, and all, and, and you know, uh, other measures of uh, uh, living standards to know that China, Nigeria, and Denmark are world apart. So that's why it is also important if, you look, if, if we see what China is doing today, the emphasis on high quality development, high quality development. This is language that is being reinforced over and over again on how they can transform speed or sorry, less emphasis on speed and transform this humongous, you know, and really uh, admirable develop, uh, economic growth into real practical, you know, development that will capture way more than just, you know, the GDP. So, but essentially, uh, lastly, I, a bit of more uh, comparison. We always find here in Africa, when we're looking at China and looking at all of these uh, these major countries that have been able to pull pull, you know, impressive growth and development development. You know, we always we're always in this uh, dilemma where, if you want to look towards the West, the emphasis on governance and institutions and democracy. And in and you know, physical uh, you know uh, physical transparency and all of that. And then if we're looking towards uh, China, we're, we're seeing more about having independent political institutions and rule of infrastructure, which is very you know which is uh, very very important. So, what here it's good to look at very clear examples and why infrastructure. Is proven to it, it is proven to be very very important in in a country development. Not just we not just with uh, for China, for example, you know, you would uh, based on allegations of lack of trans uh, lack of uh, uh, accountability and transparency and environmental considerations. The World Bank actually stopped a 500 and 500 million dollar uh, dollar loan to Ethiopia that was trying to generate electricity. You know, to power a development growth, you know, uh, and and for for the Gibe Three Dam, and also did the same thing when we was trying to secure financing for the Ethiopian Grand Renaissance Dam, which the country continues to argue is crucial for its own you know develop development and any energy needs. But so that that pushed Ethiopia to actually get this money from within. So in Ethiopia, every civil servant has to forfeit one month of. You're nearly yeah. out of time. One month of their salaries to finance these dumps. So what I'm trying to say here is there's a good, there is good and 
to see what China has been able to do with its own model of development that prioritizes soft infrastructure, you know, quality of life and hard infrastructure. And that is also something that, you know, uh, the world has a lot to learn from, particularly us, you know, here, you know, in Africa. So um, again, it's a pleasure to be here to share, you know, uh, my perspective on China's development and also looking at it from the, pers the perspective of uh, for Nigerian and African, you know, uh, contributing to this talk. Thank you.